All right. So as you can see uh, today, chapter 10, last day of finance. Thank God we made it. The worst class uh, possible. We're, we're on the last day. So um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about defaults and foreclosures. Um, you know, it, it, unfortunately, it is um, it is a part of, uh, you know, what happens in real estate defaults and foreclosures um, and, you know, kind of dealing with them. So we'll go into a little bit of detail about it um, and then uh, we'll get into that video and then we'll be done for the day. Maybe hopefully early Friday, you know what I'm saying? It's always a good, it's always a good feeling. Um, so defaults and foreclosures here. Uh, government, uh, you know, the government obviously offers programs for at-risk homeowners. Um, you know, as we've said before, borrowers have to uh, meet certain DTI requirements, those debt to income requirements. Uh, there's, we've gone through them all multiple times and we'll go over them a little more today. Uh, the requirements that borrowers have to uh, meet uh, to be able to uh, apply for a loan and qualify for that loan. So, um, you know, they're, the government, you know, thankfully they are always there to help because, uh, you know, houses aren't cheap and crazy stuff happens all the time with, sorry, one second, in here. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, where was I at? I was talking about the government. You know, the government uh, and their programs for the, for at-risk homeowners, uh, you know, just being a regular lender, a regular bank off the street, um, especially after 08, uh, they were very, very cautious about uh, handing out loans to um, willy-nilly. Uh, after that crash, they, you know, they started, started tightening down their restrictions on the qualifications for their loans and everything. So, um, you know, when it came to at-risk people, um, it was hard for them to secure a loan. And that's why we, um, you know, why lenders started, uh, you know, having their loans insured um, by the FHA. And, and we talked, we went into detail yesterday um, and the day before about FHA, FHA insurance on loans. Um, you know, talking about, uh, you know, loan failures lead to accelerated foreclosure rates. Uh, you know, you know, if, if a lot of people start failing on their loans, especially you start hitting the 60, 70% mark, um, not only is it going to tank the economy, I mean, tank the, uh, the housing market and create a bunch of uh, foreclosures, but what's going on, brother? Happy. Um, but it's, uh, you know, those loan failures are going to, um, they're going to crash the economy as well. So, you know, once the economy, the housing market starts going down, the foreclosure rate uh, tends to skyrocket pretty quick. Um, you know, and that's why uh, we're talking about defaults um, and the acceleration clause. Uh, so what the acceleration clause is, is, um, you know, say why it has, the, has a mortgage on a house um, and, you know, he's paying uh, he's paying his mortgage, paying his note, uh, keeping up to date, and all of a sudden he loses his job. Well, you know, at the end of that first month, uh, his the lender is going to send him a send him a you know a missed payment notice. Um, at the end of the second month, they're going to give him a second payment notice uh, and say, hey, a third, uh, you know, it's going to be bad news for you, buddy. Like you better you better tighten up and get this payment in. Um, and then if, after three months of non-payment. Um, he has technically breached contract with that lender, um, and, and he has breached that promissory note that he has signed with them. Uh, so that lender will enact the acceleration clause, uh, with Wyatt here. And what that means is they can require that the, um, the entire, the entire loan amount, uh, not just those three payments that he missed, that entire loan amount, uh, be paid in full at that moment. Um, and I mean, you can only really imagine the, the amount of problems that would cause, uh, requiring that a whole loan be paid after three months of non-payment. Uh, this is kind of, uh, it remedies the case of if, um, why, if 
the lender were to have to go down to the courthouse and file a judgment and try to take bite to court every month uh, for uh, for 30 years or for how much ever left how much ever left he how many ever payments he has left on his loan um, I mean they would be at the courthouse forever and the and the courts would be even more backed up than, than they already are like we said um, if you're just trying to go down there and uh, and get you know a regular court date for for a civil suit it could be you know, a couple of years um, at, in some places. So it's difficult to get a court date, but that, that acceleration clause does, is it, it makes the, the full payment amount um, due at the end of that third month. Um, if White's not able to pay, which the majority of people won't be able to pay the rest of their note, um, it's gonna it's gonna lead to a foreclosure sale um, and the, the bank's gonna get their money. So um, obviously this chapter's all about foreclosures and defaults. So. Um, we'll get a little bit more into that here in a little bit. Um, you know, workouts, they also, they do, they do some, some lenders uh, do workouts or, you know, uh, you know, this isn't talking about, you know, going to the gym, lenders don't go to the gym. I, I mean, some do maybe, but uh, not all of them. Uh, but when we're talking about workouts, we're talking about um, loan modifications. And, you know, this is, you know, after maybe two months of non-payment, they've given Wyatt <clears throat> multiple notices on that. Um, he lost, he didn't lose his job, but, you know, he sends a notice to the bank or he goes and talks to his lender and he's like, hey, you know, I got, I have a new new job lined up and, you know, I started the first of, uh, the first of June here. So, I mean, only a couple more weeks that I'll, I'll be out of money, um, you know, but I do have something lined up. I will be able to pay you, you know, can we, can we work something out? Maybe push these two months that I've missed to the end of the loan and, you know, I'll pick it back up uh, at the beginning of July. Not all lenders are going to work with you on that, uh, but there are some that will. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, this is, that's a pretty good uh, alternative to uh, having that lender enact the acceleration clause and, and making that uh, loan payment due in full because obviously, you know, like I said, not everybody has the money uh, to just pay for the, the full loan amount, obviously, if they're not able to pay for two months. Um, but yeah, that'd be good on that. Talking about delinquencies here, um, you know, delinquencies are, are, you know, stuff that, you know, you could uh, be not sued, but you, I mean, you could be uh, revoked or evicted from your property for, um, obviously, if you don't pay your principal and interest, um, that's just your regular note that you pay on the house, your regular, you know, quote unquote mortgage. Um, obviously, if you're not paying that, they're, they're most likely the, the lender's going to kick you out. Uh, they're going to sell your, your home at a foreclosure sale, um, get as much as they can, and and, um, and make mo their money that way. You know, there's a lot of times where um, they won't get the full amount that you owe. You know, say why it owes, you know, he, he has a $250,000 house. He's only paid, you know, 15000 of it. He's only been in for, for a, a year or two. Um, and when the, the bank goes to foreclose on it or his lender goes to foreclose and they go to sell, um, well, it only sells for 200,000 because uh, it's at auction. It's not like they get to just put it up for list price and then sit on it. Uh, they're gonna sell it for as much as they can, as quick as they can to get their money. And if it only sells for 200,000, um, well, you've only paid 15, you know, that means you got 35, there's 35,000 missing there. Uh, and you know, what they're gonna do is they're gonna hit you with a, um, a bad debt, um, a 1099 at the end of the year, uh, bad debt for $35,000. And uh, what that is, is they are going to come for that money. Um, not only that, but the federal government is going to add that bad debt to your income. Um, so say you make $100,000 a year, but with that $35,000 of bad debt, uh, they're going to tax you like you made $135,000. So it's, it's very key uh, to not get, you know, to make sure you pay your, uh, make sure you pay your mortgage, make sure you pay your note, uh, and don't get stuck with any of that bad debt because uh, you don't want banks coming after you, and uh, I mean, you don't want to be taxed at more than you're actually making because that's just more money out of your pocket. Um, property taxes, property taxes are a huge thing. Uh, you know, if there's if there's one thing that uh, uh, that if anybody knows anything about uh, the government, it's, I mean, you don't mess with the tax, the tax dude. 
uh, you always need to pay your taxes, especially your property taxes. Um, you know, say why you're in that $250,000 house. It's a really, really nice, say you're in a $400,000 house. You're in a $450,000 house, you know, your crazy amount. Um, but your annual property taxes, you live out in, out in the middle of nowhere. So it's not, it's not high value property. Um, you know, and, and say your property taxes are $1,000 a month. You know, your notes, uh, the note on your house is five or 6,000, but your pro property tax is only a thousand a year. Um, if you don't pay that thousand a year, uh, dang sure, you, I mean, you better be certain that the, uh, the tax man, they're gonna come for your home. Uh, they're gonna sell it. And are, are they gonna sell it for the, you know, just two or $3,000 that you've accumulated over the past couple years in property taxes? Uh, you wouldn't think that they would, but they sure will. They'll, they'll sell your house. Um, you know, make that two or 3,000 bucks that they needed, uh, pay the rest off in the note, and then you're stuck without a home and everybody else is, they're all paid and happy. So uh, you definitely want to pay the, the property tax uh, people. Um, uh, talking about um, homeowner's insurance, um, you know, other, or we can talk about other liens, other liens on the property, and it's very rare. Uh, but mechanical mechanic liens uh, can be filed um, and your house can be sold um, in regards to a mechanics lien. Um, you know, if you have somebody come install a pool for $50,000 and you tell them, you're like, hey, yeah, I'll pay you, don't worry about it. Um, and you never end up sending that to them. Uh, they can, if they go through the right process and the right steps through the courts, uh, they can um, require a foreclosure on your home uh, for payment to them. Uh, so not only, you know, you know, you're out of a house and you're getting more of that bad debt uh, that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, homeowners insurance. Uh, this is another thing, you know, the bank requires you, uh, your lender will most likely require you to have homeowners insurance um, just in case if any kind of emergency disaster happens, taking down that house, you know, just making sure they're covered and their money's um, protected. Um, if they find out that you don't have a homeowner's insurance policy, uh, they can come after your home, sell it for foreclosure, um, and get that money back. Uh, poor property management. A lot of people don't think, um, you know, HOAs could, can kick you out or can foreclose on your home for any reason. Uh, they definitely can. You know, there's been um, instances where, you know, an HOA will have a rule where no more than two um, unrelated people can live under one roof. Um, and if they, if they find you in violation of that, uh, they can evict you and uh, foreclose on that house of, on, uh, that house of yours. Um, another thing is if you know, they don't have dues, if you have unpaid dues, even though here in the Bryan College Station area, um, dues are typically you know, two to $300 a year um, and for, for HOA, uh, they definitely can foreclose on your home. They have that power, um, you know, back so, yeah, I know. It's crazy. Back where I'm from um, in Amarillo, uh, we live uh, in an HOA where you have to, uh, you're only allowed to have two trees in your front yard and they have to be planted eight feet from the sidewalk. And there's only like six specific trees that you can plant in this, in your yard. They have to be two, that you can have two or three in your front yard. Um, they have to be eight feet off the sidewalk and in separate, like equally equidistant, uh, you know, space apart. Uh, so HOA, they have, uh, they have some crazy, crazy rules. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, now my, uh, you know, we built my sister a playhouse. Another crazy rule that they had is, um, you know, we built my sister a playhouse uh, when she was, I mean, I think she's probably turning like seven or eight. It was really, really young. But they, I mean, it's a good, um, it's about 50 square foot playhouse, you know, upstairs, downstairs, uh, air conditioned, all that. And uh, we didn't. I mean, not even thinking of it, uh, we didn't use the same uh, color roof tiles um, that was on our house. And uh, we got hit with a, a thousand dollar fine and they um, threatened to tear, uh, tear down the playhouse or uh, kick us out of our home uh, that we had just built. So, um, and you know, we did have to, we did have to abide by those rules. So we had to unfortunately get up there, uh, take all the shingles off of her playhouse and, uh, and put more up. So yeah, HOAs, uh, you'll run into them quite a bit. 
uh, not a whole lot of people like them when buying houses because they do they are very uh, strict on their rules um, but yeah they do have the ability to evict you from your home and, uh, and foreclose if you are um, you know not not uh, abiding by those rules in any way so uh, you definitely want to be careful for the HOAs because they are out here mm. adjustments um, you know talking about adjustments and defaults and foreclosures um, there is you know what's called the final foreclosure action um, and here in Texas um, if you if you receive a final foreclosure action uh, that means I mean you were completely out of your property that it is going to um, a tax sale or a foreclosure sale um, you know at the at the steps of the county courthouse um, on the first Tuesday of the month is is that just a Texas rule or is that everywhere in the America? Texas. Okay, so just in Texas, uh, the first uh, the first Tuesday, um, uh, or the second Tuesday, sorry about that, the second Tuesday of every month uh, at the county courthouse, um, hint, hint on that uh, for your test, looking through, uh, county courthouse. County courthouse. Yeah, the courthouse, yeah, just remember that. Um, so uh you know here in texas once you get that final foreclosure uh you're done uh you know depending on where you live in other states and this is something you might you'll need to know for your national exam uh so that's why they include it in here but the moratoriums uh this is the time of you know after a foreclosure um there is a redemption period and it depends on what state you live in um how long this period is uh it can be anywhere from uh you know one to six months uh, that you'll have you'll be able to come back and redeem and get and get uh, retain ownership of that property um, the only thing is is the government allows um, you to be charged 18 percent interest uh, per month that it is um, in that moratorium period so uh, you obviously you want to try to stay away from that as much as possible because 18 percent you know if it's just a hundred thousand dollar house after one month that's a hundred eighteen thousand um, dollars so it's a, it's a crazy crazy um, amount that it will spike up by so you definitely don't want to hit that six month period of compounding into interest um, recasting uh, what this is is uh, some lenders will let you give a large lump sum payment uh, to take down the principal the other restrictions and rules within your mortgage will stay the same your interest rate obviously your term um, all that will continue to be the same but some of them will let um, you do some recasting and bring a large lump sum and and pay down that principal so if you ever run into a, a, a situation where you're able to um, afford this first off um, and they offer it I would highly advise you do that because I mean again taking down that principal is the main is the main goal when paying on a, on a loan. Uh, deed in lieu, uh, what this is in foreclosures is um, sometimes, you know, people are so bad in the hole. Um, this happened in uh, 2008 quite a bit. Uh, people knew that they weren't going to be able to make the payments on their houses. They, they were tired of messing with it. So what they did is they just signed over, um, they signed over the deed back to their lender. Um, completely without trying to fight it or you know stain it at all they just here you go here's the house you have it sell it um, do whatever you want with it but you know I'm done um, unfortunately in doing this um, especially in 2008 you know the, the whole economy crashed so houses weren't selling for uh, what they were actually marketed at and sold for previously so like we said earlier or like I was talking about earlier um, you know they would they were selling or giving back basically these three hundred thousand dollar houses, and when the lenders would put them up on the market for sale, uh, they were only selling for two hundred thousand. And uh, you know the lenders are, you know, their business. Uh, they're there to make money. Uh, so what they did is they would hit they would hit those borrowers with that bad debt, um, that ten ninety nine form at the end of the year, um, and which would add you know another hundred thousand dollars to their uh, to those borrowers income quote unquote um, and so they would be taxed at the federal level for um, whatever they made obviously plus another hundred thousand dollars so uh, the banks are always going to come for their money 
Um, and then on top of that, you still had, they would come after you, come after your personal property uh, for $100,000. So, uh, you know, that's why, you know, in talking yesterday about, um, you know, once you get your license, once you are licensed, uh, you you want to make sure your your clients are, are getting into loans or, or applying for houses and you're looking for houses that they can afford. Because, uh, I mean, the last thing you want to do is be the reason that, you know, a client is, is having to pay more in taxes and is getting chased by the IRS and is just going through a lot of uh, financial difficulty because they were approved and, and for a five hundred half a million dollar loan, uh, but really they should have been paying, you know, around the $350,000 range. Uh, you just want to be really careful with that. Um, FHA and VA, uh, so these obviously, um, these are governmentally funded loans in the first place. Um, so if, if they are foreclosed on, um, they're not gonna, you know, the, the government's not gonna sell, you know, double dip itself um, and save itself twice. So uh, these will just go straight to auction, um, you know, and, um, you know, when the government pays for something, whose money is it? Yeah, it's, it's taxes. So, you know, the, the, the government's not going to obviously pay for the house in the first place and then, uh, you know, pay themselves back. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So FHA and VA, um, when they go to auctions, that money is given back to the, to the government. And then um, it's kind of left out of right at that point. It's, it's done. Uh, they don't really chase after those people anymore. So, um, and then talking about equitable um, and statutory redemption periods. Yeah, uh, like I was talking talking earlier, uh, you know, some clo uh, some states, not Texas. Texas, once you're foreclosed on, you're out of the property. That's all you get. Um, but um, you know, some states do have uh, periods of time where you can, uh, you know, those few months where you can uh, qualify and buy back into your house. I'm talking of the types of foreclosures. Uh, there's a judicial foreclosure and sale, uh, which, why, what does judicial mean? Judicial. Yeah. Judicial branch also. Court. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically just talking about the court. Um, you know, conventional FHA insurer and VA guaranteed mortgages, uh, these will all be done through um, through the court. Uh, that's just that's the, the basic information you need to know on that. The non-judicial power of sale, this is done through the deed of trust and the mortgage. And if you remember, the deed of trust is that three-party system where you have the borrower, the trustee, and the trustor. Um, that deed will go from the, the borrower and it'll go to the lender's attorney. Um, and once, once the borrower pays that, uh, pays that lender in full, uh, the lender will tell that attorney, all right, you can release the deed to them. Uh, they'll release the deed and, and you know, they'll gain ownership of the property. Um, but if you remember that deed of trust, uh, that lender's attorney, they don't have to go through a full court hearing. They're able to go through, uh, you know, just, just take it up to the court, get a few papers signed by a judge, um, and that will give uh, permission back to, or not permission, but ownership back to the lender automatically. So um, that's non-judicial, what we consider non-judicial, there's not an actual hearing, uh, you don't have to set an actual court date. It's just something that that attorney will, he will go to the court, but it'll be something real snappy. And I mean, nobody else will really be involved besides him up, up at the courthouse. Um, and then talking strict, uh, strict foreclosure is that contract for deed. Um, if you remember what the contract for deed is, uh, that is where, you know, the seller um, is basically seller finances the loan to the borrower um, and is, uh, you know, you know it's, it's that slime ball that I talked about, that slime ball scenario where, um, you know, at 11, at 29 years, 11 months, uh, they, they leave on the third day of the month and they don't get that rent payment, so they keep the deed. Um, and they make that borrower start completely over on that on that loan. So in any, huh? Yeah, yeah, just in bamboo, exactly. Uh, so anytime you see a contract for deed, 
I know. I thought it, it looked like I had something to do. Uh, so anytime you see that contract for deed, um, you know, the, the first thing you should think about is attorney. Um, you need to go talk with your attorney, and not only are they going to go talk with their attorney, uh, but you're going to be go. You're going to be talking with their attorney as well with them. Uh, you're going to be traveling along with them, uh, having multiple conversations, making sure everything's good, making sure everything's straight, and you're on top of that because. Uh, uh, like I said, and, and like we talked about for in depth the other day, that's something that you can that can really put your high, uh, clients in a hole um, if it's not done correctly. Um, and then foreclosure by um, foreclosure by advertisement. Um, you know, this is just talking about you know throwing throwing it in the in the daily paper, talking about you know meet at the uh, courthouse this first Tuesday. This this property is going to go on uh, sale. Um, Entering possession. Uh, when you do foreclosure sales, typically the um, entry is very limited. You're not allowed to uh, go through the property um, and, and look through it when it's being sold through the courthouse at a foreclosure sale. Uh, you'll be able to go, I mean, obviously you can drive up to the property, look around the outside of it. Um, if one of the windows is open, you can, you know, pop up the window and um, sneak in and look around. It's, it's going to be illegal, but you know I've heard of people doing it just to try to get a, a fair estimate of, of what just, the insides like, and you know trying to give a, a fair um, uh, when it goes to auction, you know kind of what give a fair price of what they think it's worth. Um, but you know you won't just have uh, ac uh, equal access to the property. The only um, people that will have access to the property are, um, and that's talking about the writ of entry. Uh, this is basically just a right of entry um, by a judge, and it has to be signed by a judge, and it'll only be for the lender uh, to be able to go through the house to make sure everything's okay. Um, yeah, she's coming back in. Um, yeah, it's that right of entry, um, you know, trying to get back in. Uh, let them go through the house, you know, because there's sometimes, you know, um, it, when in foreclosure sales, I've heard of you know instances where, you know, I mean, if you're going, if you're getting foreclosed on, um, your home is, and you know, it's been your home for, you know, a little bit, um, you know, you're not going to be too happy being kicked out of it. Uh, so there's people that will, um, you know, I've heard of instances where they pour, you know, uh, mix up some concrete and they'll pour it down the toilet and in the bathtub. Um, and, you know, kind of ruin the plumbing of the house. Uh, you know, there's instances like that. So uh, obviously, you know, the lenders need to know that. It's, it kind of, it would be nice for the people who are uh, bidding on the property to be able to know that, but that's kind of why we, they don't let them uh, in is because, you know, when, when your property is getting foreclosed on, uh, you know, you're typically not too happy. You're not gonna, you're not gonna take, uh, maintain very good care of it. Um, I've heard of people, you know, obviously, uh, you know, taking a leak all over the place, you know, just using it as a restroom, really. Uh, yeah, pouring concrete down toilets, um, knocking out walls, and, you know, I mean, and, and for no no construction reason. I mean, just, you know, between the studs, busting up all the sheetrock, um, really just tearing up the house because uh, if, they're, if their house is getting foreclosed on, well, I mean, they're, they're not wanting to give it back to the lender in very good condition. They, they don't want the lender to get a lot of money for it. Um, and the lender, it, he, they most likely won't get a whole lot of money for it. But, um, you know, what will happen is, uh, you know, you, like I, I was talking about that bad, bad debt earlier. Um, if it doesn't, at the sale, if it doesn't sell for the price that uh, you still owe on it, um, along with the repairs, um, you know, so when they poured concrete down the toilet and in the bathtub, um, it ended up costing around $50,000 in plumbing repairs to fix all of that uh, throughout the house. So um, not, you know, and the lender's not gonna pay for that. They didn't create those problems. Uh, so that was more bad debt that was added on to um, those people's um, income statement. Um, so that's an extra $50,000 that they were taxed on uh, and ended up having to pay. So, um, you know, if you if your house is ever foreclosed on, if, you, if you're in that unfortunate circumstance, 
Um, don't go around beating everything up because you will end up having to pay for it. Um, and talk to your clients as well um, and let them know because I guess a lot of people don't know. They think they're, you know, once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, they're not going to come after them anymore. Uh, very untrue. They are going to come after you. They are going to get their money. Uh, so you need to be wary of that. Uh, foreclosure miscellaneous. Uh, you know, deficiency judgments. <clears throat> um, and sue on note, and that's, you know, this is this is kind of what I was talking about uh, actually right there. Um, you know, if you if you have a $250,000 house, it's being foreclosed on, um, and it only sells for $200,000, well, you know, you're, they're going to come at you. They're going to file a deficiency judgment against you for that $50,000. That's going to be that $50,000 of bad debt. And then any kind of, um, you know, any kind of damages that you uh, do to the property, uh, they're going to come for you for, come for that as well. Um, so if those damages, you know, are 20,000 or 50,000, they're going to come at you for either 70 or a hundred thousand. Um, and they're going to hit you with a deficiency. Deficit, hold on deficiency yeah. judgment there we go nailed it um deficiency judgment they're gonna hit you with that for whatever amount that is so uh, just be careful on that i just i, I kind of got ahead of my notes there and i started talking uh, one slide early um but uh you know and then again it's not allowed for fha or va loans uh, because obviously the government's not gonna take money from itself to pay itself that just doesn't make sense government money is government money uh, so that is not allowed on FHA or VA loans. Um, and then talking about the tax impacts, um, the IRS might may consider gain. Um, gain is just more of that bad debt, take, technically. Um, so I think y'all all y'all all understand that because if I talk about it, it'll be the third time in a row that I've talked about bad debt. Um, and then uh, you know, the Mortgage Forgiveness Debt a Relief Act of 2007, uh, basically just made it to where, um, you know, the federal government couldn't come after any more of your money once your house was foreclosed on uh, for that time period. Um, so, um, and that is, that's going to be it for um, our slides today. So very quick, like I said, um, here is, it, I'm sorry, it's, it's, a, it's a 30 minute buster, but um, it is it is very beneficial to uh, the finance exam. Um, so after we get through this, um, we'll just need to come up with a test time. Um, and then um, we can also talk about uh, after after the video, uh, anybody who wants to shadow uh, through um, Noble's Realty Group up here. Um, and we also have agents in the Houston area. We have agents in the Austin area. And uh, we are soon to have agents in the Dallas area. Um, and then we'll also have agents in, in the Amarillo area. If anybody, I know nobody's a town gang here, but um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I am heading back here in a couple months. So um, we'll talk about that, uh, the test time. Um, and then uh, before we kind of get this video started, um, if y'all will online um, put your, um, a good email address for you in the chat. Uh, so when I do get that, um, when I do get those 40 questions uh, fixed up, I can, uh, I'll just email all of y'all a PDF with those questions. Um, and we'll kind of do it that way. So yeah, if y'all don't mind throwing it in, uh, throwing that in the chat, we'll start the video and uh, get out of here today. All right, do you see the practice exams? Yes. Okay, so let's go over this finance section right here. Yes. Let's see how you do. All right, first one. Here, read it out loud, and then we'll see if we get the answer. Subordination clause in a trust deed may allow for periodic regeneration and adjustment in terms of obligation, permit the obligation to be paid ahead of schedule gives priority to lien subsequent recorded against the property, <clears throat> prohibit the trustor from making an additional loan against the property before the trustee is paid off. C. Excellent. Good job. 
the shadow of a subordination clause, um, the second loan takes priority. Yeah. All right. Now we're situated. The majority of money used for loans of real estate comes from federal reserves, uh, co-op savings, government bonds, and individual savings. Individual savings. Good. That's just like the bank when people deposit money in the bank. The term warehousing as used in real estate financing means B. Oh, wow. Oh, okay, I thought it was D or B. No, it's just okay. collecting loans prior to resale. So it's like selling loans in a bulk with a six pack of soda. To the secondary market, correct? Right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Okay, six pack of soda. It's not really the six pack of soda. <laughs> <laughs> Why would a beneficiary have an appraisal on the property? A beneficiary would do it to make sure. That it's C, but it's because I, I remember I remember the muscle memory. Now, okay. why? I, I initially, what I thought was it was to um, determine the value of the property because that's what the appraisal is, right? It's to to make an estimate of the value of the property. Um, okay. Do you remember what the difference between a uh, mortgage and mortgage or is? Mortgagee, um, the mortgagee receives the mortgage? No, remember the mortgage or gives the promissory note and use that property as collateral, correct? Correct. What does that mean, collateral? Um, that if he doesn't pay the mortgage, he's going to leave the house. That's okay. specific meaning. Okay, so then the bank needs to know the house you cover the loan, right? Yes. Uh, so now look at this question again. Okay, so why would a beneficiary have an appraisal to the property? So he would do it to assure the property value is sufficient to cover the loan. But the beneficiary is the one that owns the property, correct? They're the bank. Okay, so it's a bank. Oh, okay. I'm imagining a beneficiary as like a friend. No. Like uh, a trust or. Oh, okay, so it's a bank. Got it, got it. Why would a bank have appraisal? Okay, got it. Okay. Technically, it's any way you can lend money, which is usually that's the bank. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we All right. A veteran purchases a home under the Calvet loan in such transaction. Who holds title? A. Okay, what kind of title is it? Legal title or equitable title? Oh. I believe it's equitable title. Because if it was legal title, he would own, uh, the veteran would own the property under himself. Okay, so legal title is the right to sell. Equitable title is the right to use and possess. Okay? Got it, right? So okay, equitable well, title is the guy well, who gave them up? Yeah. yeah. Use and possess. Yeah. And gain equity. Yeah, I just wanted to say equity. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you need to talk to us? The, a, the APR is defined by the federal truth and lending laws as A, the total cost of which uh, the total cost which the borrower must pay to get the loan, B, relative cost of credit expressed in percentage terms, C, the total indirect cost of which the borrower must pay, or D, the total of the direct cost of the credit paid by the borrower. B. Good. Okay. Excellent. The term warehousing used in real estate financing means which is D. Warehousing. Oh, sorry, my mouth is cold. No problem. Hey. Okay, I got it. 
Any fault at all about that. Yeah. He's sick. He's sick. Mom's always oh. going to track you down, right? <laughs> always. Also, calling which is the best definition of a balloon payment? Um, a, a payment of the, a payment to a prepayment to prevent a prepayment penalty? No. The 10th annual payment of a 30 year loan? No. The required payment of interest that is accumulated prior to the first regular installment? Or D, the required payment of the entire balance due? Interest that is accumulated. I would have to say C. Oh, okay, so a balloon payment, would it, an acceleration clause or a due on sale clause be the requiring of a payment due all at once? Well, That's first of all, let's take a step back, all right? Yeah. What's the amortization? Um, the uh, deduction in a loan over the period of time. Okay, there's three types you basically got to know if you're Okay, you have a fully amortized loan. Okay. The straight the uh, low, okay, and you have a negative amortization, and then there's the blue payment, excuse me, four. Fully straight, uh, negative, and what was the last the one? The balloon low. Oh, balloon, got it. Okay. Full, fully amortized low is very simple. You make payments, and your debt goes down. Okay, interest only, the straight low, you make payments, but your debt stays the same. How's that possible? Your debt stays the same. Um, well, you're just paying enough to get by, right? You're just paying the interest. Yeah, you're just paying the interest. Okay. Then what's negative amortization? That's when you make payments and your debt increases. So how does that yeah. happen? Um, for example, you have a ten dollar debt and interest is twenty percent, but you're paying ten percent every month. Or you're paying eleven dollars every month. So. Yeah, right? yeah. You're paying less than the interest. Paying less than the interest. So to use your example in more simple terms, you yeah. owe ten dollars, you're paying two dollars a month in interest, but you only pay one dollar a month. Yeah. Okay. All right. A balloon payment is what they call a partially amortized loan. Okay. That's when you make that payment, it's like that fully amortized loan, but there's a point where you have to make one big payment. In other words, it doesn't fully amortize in a nice even downward line. Mm -hmm. It like drops off on your cliff. Got it. Either in the beginning or at the end, or does it really matter? It's designated between you and the lender. Um, okay. Got it. For financing a home with a long-term loan, if equal monthly payments are made, the amount of each payment applied to the outstanding principal balance will the amount, the amount of each payment applied to the outstanding principal balance it will a increase while the interest payments decrease excellent good okay so on a level payment loan, what's a level payment loan? It's just those equal monthly payments, that straight note we just spoke about. Straight note. Oh, okay, got it. Straight note. Straight note. An increase in the availability of money would lead to which effect? So more money would lead to... D. Interest rates would go down. Good, excellent. Okay. When purchasing with FHA financing, a new buyer would normally do each of the following except B, because there is no such thing in the office. Okay, so what's the answer? B? Oh, B, yeah, B is the board, yeah. Oh, you said that. Good, excellent. Yeah. Remember, what's the FHA? It's an insurer Excellent. of a Good government job. of a government loan or well, they insure loans. Oh, so it doesn't have to be government. Well, they have to be qualified. Qualified. This is an insured qualified loan. Got it. Of the following, which is the best definition of a balloon payment? 
D, the required payment of the entire balance due. Good. Oh, I've got a lot more problems. Tim sold his home for 30 grand and took back a note for 15 grand with interest of 9% per annum. The note was secured by a first mortgage. The home, he, the home had a fair market value of 29 grand. Later, he decided to sell the mortgage and note, which he just discounted for 13 grand. He then sold it to Eric. On the back of the note, he wrote, I hereby assign the within note to Eric without recourse. If the maker of the note defaults before any principal payments are made, Eric's best legal remedy is to A, foreclose or recover 13 grand, foreclose the enforced payment for 15 grand, C, the assign nor based upon the endorsees, recover from the recover from Tim based upon 13 grand notes. B, Foreclose the enforcement of 15 grand. Excellent. So that's a really long word. Problem. It's really not yeah. because it really Legal. is just saying like what you owe is what you gotta pay. You know, they're just going after it. So once they said the note is 15 grand, everything else was just nonsense. Oh, okay. So Tim Slip is home. So where did the note? The note what is the promissory note, what you owe. Oh, it's a promissory note. I was thinking in terms of a straight note. So when they say 30 grand home, it doesn't matter if it's 30 grand or 500 grand. It matters yeah. what the debt is. Mm. So took back a promissory note for 15 grand with the 9% per annum. So that's one of those long questions, but it's actually deceiving. It's not as far as it looks. Yeah, those are the ones that obviously get a complete note. The release clause in a mortgage. Allows portions of the property given as security to be released from the mortgage upon performance by a specific act. B. Good. In the security. Now, why why wouldn't it be D? Because it releases portions of the property. And so, blanket mortgage covers more than one. Oh, okay. okay. Got it. Got it. The term warehousing with regard to a mortgage means uh, making loans, interest rates, making long term loans. Accepting unsecured loans, selling loans on the secondary market. D. Good job. There we go. Warehousing notice. The federal right to cancel notice must be given to a borrower by the agent if the money will be used for a business expansion, the borrower's residence is the security for the loan. The loan is not secured by the borrower's dwelling and more than 25000 is being borrowed. The commercial building is being used for the security for the loan. The federal right to cancel a notice must be given to a borrower by the agent. Given to a borrower by the agent. I would say B as in boy. The borrower's residence is security for the loan. Excellent. Good. So why the borrower's residence must be given? So it's pretty much collateralized. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're getting this. You're gonna do well tomorrow. You're yeah. doing well. <laughs> I had a dream about PMI. I was, I mean, I was studying all last night about FHA loans, and I was watching videos on conventional <laughs> loans. Dreams. I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about PMI, and you know, twenty percent. Yeah, private mortgage insurance. So explain that. Yeah. So you just mentioned that. So tell me uh, what your dream was about. What, what's going on with that PMI? So a conventional loan is the most traditional loan where uh, it requires to have 20% down, and if not, you pay a private mortgage insurance. Good. Excellent. Okay. Because, which is yeah. Uh, which is pretty much safety for the lender. There you go. Good. So if you're borrowing too much, then 
Uh, now, if you're borrowing too little and you're paying the private mortgage insurance, right, you can stop paying it once you reach 20% of the down payment. Right? Yeah, but don't worry about that. Okay. If I already defaulted on a real property installment sales contract that had been recorded by itself, if a quick claim deed were to be extinguished to the cloud on the title, it must be executed by. The buyer defaulted on a real property installment, a real property installment says contract. A buyer and seller. Oh, so, buyer only. Buyer only. Why is that? Is the defendant a default? So a default means that they did not make the payments. The one who loans the money on a parcel of property and secures that loan by means of deed of trust is known as the B beneficiary. Excellent. Good. So who's the trustor, trustee, and beneficiary? So the trustor is one borrowing the money. The trustee is a third party and a, a friend of the beneficiary. The beneficiary is the loaner or the lender slash bank. Who has legal title? Uh, trustor. Nope. Oh, beneficiary? Nope. Oh, shit. That's when a third party comes in. The trustee receives the legal title. Oh, okay. The trustee receives the legal title. Yes, and that's the right to sell. The trustor has an equitable title. Which is? The right to live in it and the right to gain it. Now, what happens in a default? It, there was a question that I ran across saying so, that. Okay. Yeah, so the beneficiary will notify the trustee, and the trustee will conduct a trustee sale. And they can do that because they have a legal title. Mm, okay. And then, all right, cool. Right, at the same time as the trustor pays everything off, the beneficiary will notify the trustee, and then the trustee will give a deed of reconveyance. Deed of reconveyance. Yeah, which gives legal title back to the trustor. But first, the beneficiary has to request the uh, right. reconveyance, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The beneficiary of a second trust deed sold his interest in property for less than the unpaid balance of the note. This action is most commonly described as the beneficiary sold leverage deed. Oh, discounting. Discounting the selling the note for a last. Yeah, same way, not discount. Okay. The beneficiary of the service. Which of the following statements about real estate finances is incorrect? A promissory note is security for a mortgage. A note of a property involves money besides the mortgage called the mortgage or discounting a note indicates that it is being less so space value. B, as in boy, the owner of a property will. Oh. Promissory note is security for a mortgage. Incorrect. Oh, got it. got it. Yeah, I gotta be careful of that. Because we went over. I think you understand the concept of a promissory note and a mortgage. Uh, yeah, I'm getting. I'm getting. You just missed that incorrect part. Yeah, and I do that a lot. I get in such a rush to want to get the answer right. I look for all these key terms and the answers, and I just kind of miss out on some of the words on top. Yeah, you'll do that. All right. Which of the following statements about real estate financing is incorrect? D is in dog. You promise to know the security for the mortgage. The buyer defaulted on real estate property installment sales contract that had been recorded by the seller. If a quick claim deed were to be used to extinguish the cloud on title, it must be executed by B. Buyer only. Good. Which of these changes would least likely to affect interest rates? New government loan programs aimed at low income housing in, the, in urban areas. A. Erratic spending patterns by government A. No, A, A, A. Oh, oh A, you're my bad. All right, we'll see. Yeah, that's okay. That's right, you're right. My bad. New 
people to do it cycles. The beneficiary of a second trust deed sold his interest in property for less than the unpaid balance of the note. This C discounted because he's paying less for an unpaid balance. Got it. Good. Got it. Got it. <clears throat> Joe failed to make payments on his trustee loan for two successive months, and a notice has notice of default has been recorded. He has uh, rights of reinstatement. A. Now, go ahead. Yeah. Under rights of redemption, it's only when it's foreclosed, correct? Correct. When Jones purchased Brown's property on installment sale, he assumed the existing loan, which exceeded Brown's basis in the property. The amount of the, of the assumed loan over Brown's property will be D treated as cat as part of the down payment whether cash was received or not. Good. And it's common sale. Now why wouldn't it be deducted from Brown's basis? Because it's not part of the, the initial fee. Um, okay, so when Joan purchased Brown's property on installment sale, which is just a regular contract, right? Yeah. He assumed the existing loan, so he just took over the loan. Right. Which exceeded Brown's basis in the property. What is, what is basis? The, the original property? cost. Oh, uh, okay. The original loan. Okay, got it. Which of the following would be considered promotional notes? B, a short term loan that allows buyers to purchase property in development. Oh, a loan to develop security secured by an improvement property. Yes. Okay, so let's see. Promotional. Yeah, just remember that one. A loan to de loan to developer. All right. Which of these changes would least likely to would least would be least likely to affect interest rates? D. You go to Which contract would be most difficult for a buyer to obtain financing? D, a land contract. The only reason why I picked that is because I know FHA conventional and VA are pretty traditional. I don't really know what a land contract is. It's when the seller right, actually becomes kind of the beneficiary. So mm -hmm. I, so you buy the property from me, instead mm -hmm. of using a bank, you make it payments to me as the seller. Oh, so I retain God. legal title and you get equity. Okay, so like a peer to peer. Yes, there you go. Uh, Never heard it. What was that? Yeah. Okay. Which of the following would be considered a promotional note? So, a loan, D, a loan to a developer secured by unimproved property. D is a developer. Yeah. Okay, so let me see one last thing. I have sure. a couple of notes there. Um, okay. What about if you like Easton and Strasburger, the Jones versus Mayor, the Alley Quist, that Alley thing? Okay, so um, Al here, just go one by one. Alley Triolos for earthquakes. Okay. I remember, I remember that. Jones versus Mayor is the one that gave birth to Fair Housing. 1968. Yeah. Easter versus Strasburger. I don't know what that is. I think that one's uh, discriminating. They don't want to do the discrimination one for another. I'll have to check that one out for you. Okay. I want to see. Maybe one more. Just remember the cues in Alan Quist. Alan Quist Triolo. Alan Quist Got it. And then you said 
um, a lot, on a lot of your webinars, 968, you see it in the answer circle it pretty much? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's not always going to be the case, but it's yeah. always, you know, it's okay. a good bet. Okay. Okay. And then uh, the township thing, on uh, some of these talks exam, I see a lot of these like township questions. Yeah. Um, how would I comprehend that? I guess what I'm asking is how many miles are in a township? And did how you does see it... the most recent video I did on Facebook? Was it 15 minutes? No. It's no, I have Facebook video. Here, look at my screen. All right, well, he only goes through uh, like two more questions. So I think I'm going to call it. I think everybody's tired of watching it. I know I am. Um, let me go ahead and stop this recording. I probably shouldn't say that long. It's, it's recording. <laughs>